Fictions is uh, one of my favorite things. It's, it can be really difficult because sometimes um, when there's something going on that's really upsetting, it's easier to just go and do something else, right? I mean, that's our natural tendency, but if we can find a way to embrace the bad and the good and step back and kind of be a witness to what's going on, then we can find maybe a new path that we hadn't thought of before. So that's what this talk is about. And I'm gonna do it kind of like a family photo album. But the funny thing is, um, these are my grandparents and on my mom's side. And the funny thing is that I found this picture in an archive, it's actually a press photo. So we don't have a family photo, like a family album, like a normal one at home. And uh, most of the pictures that you'll see in here are publicly available, you can find them online or they're in a book or something like that. Uh, my, my grandfather died a few years before I was born, and my grandmother was there while I was growing up. And you can see, um, that's a slide rule that Enrico's holding in his, in his hands there. And that's, nowadays, we think of that as kind of primitive, but in those days, um, it was what everyone was using. And the astronauts, when they went to the moon, they had to know how to use a slide rule in case the um, computer failed, they had to be able to do that. My grandmother, um, she lived till I was 20, and um, she, once Enrico had passed away, she kind of blossomed and became an author. She wrote a book about her life with my grandfather. It was on the New York Times bestseller list, and as Greg mentioned, she, she was a pioneer in the environmental and handgun control movements. And um, she had this to say about the bomb. But above all, there were, there were the moral questions. I knew scientists had hoped that the bomb would not be possible, but there it was, and it had already killed and destroyed so much. Was war or science to be blamed? Should the scientists stop the work once they realized that a bomb was feasible? Would there always be war in the future? To these kinds of questions, there is no simple answer. And then a few years, around that same time, maybe a little bit later, my grandfather said this, history of science and technology has consistently taught us that scientific advances and basic understanding have sooner or later led to technical and industrial applications that have revolutionized our way of life, right? Like iPhones, everything. What is less certain and what we all fervently hope is that man will soon grow sufficiently adult to make good use of the powers that he acquires over nature. So to me, both my grandparents are embracing contradictions. Like my grandmother's looking at how come the bomb is there and whose fault is it? And is it science? Is it war? Is it? And then my grandfather's looking at that um, fundamental conflict within us that's represented by the poster image. This, by the way, was. Um, commissioned by Psychology Today. They did a special issue last year on the psychobiology of war. So there's, on the one hand, there's the sax, like the musicality of being human, the creativity, the jazz, you know, like being able to riff with each other. And then there's the machine gun, and they're in the same case. Like, it's, it's all, both sides are within us, and how do we deal with that? So tonight I'm going to be, along with my family story, I'm going to be introducing a model that allows us to get out of that kind of trap of either or, and it's called spiral dynamics. You probably haven't heard of it. Craig hadn't heard of it. Um, and it's a color-coded system, and for the next few minutes I'm not going to explain the whole thing. I'm just kind of hinting, and then I'm going to show you a chart and really explain it. My grandfather is known as a master scientist because he contributed to many areas of physics. Um, he's also known as a master scientist because he was considered the greatest combined theoretical and experimental physicist of that time in the mid 20th century. And also um, for his role in training new physicists. And um, he, he left his own work to work on the bomb. It wasn't something that he wanted to do. It's, it was the life conditions of the time. So this first slide shows what 
he's most famous for is working on the atom bomb, and he, he actually built the first, I'll show you a photo later in the, in the presentation, he built the first nuclear chain reactor, which was a, a simple pile of uranium. It was basically like dominoes falling down, but um, it was releasing energy from the atom. And this slide is colored red, which in spiral dynamics relates to breakout energy and um, on the negative side to war and destruction. So after the war, he went back to doing his own work and blue relates to order and you need a sense of order to be able to be creative. Orange is, is actual innovation. And this is a slide showing nuclear medicine, which is one of the um, positive things that's come out of his work and those early scientists' work. So because he was at the beginning, he's, he kind of has an influence in every area of it's nuclear. Nuclear energy, which I don't know how you feel about it. Some people are really against it. Some people are for it. Um, I think it has a lot of promise, but we have to find ways to use it that are clean and safe. And green in the spiral relates to the environment and dignity for and respect for all. And of course, nuclear waste, which um, is symbolized by this woman sweeping up the, the nuclear waste, particle, particle, particle. And something that I found in my travels is that a lot of disenfranchised people end up living on the land where the nuclear waste is stored. And I don't think that's fair. So it's why I made this light green, is that, that idea of, of bringing um, respect to everyone. Among scientists, he's known as being um, a great teacher. He loved teaching. I, I met um, his biographer last night, and he was just reminding me how much my grandfather liked to talk to students. And, he didn't care if they were super bright or not. He accepted anyone in his graduate program who was interested in his work. And um, he would, he had a way of, even though what he knew was so complex, he had a way of simplifying it so that he could make someone understand. And um, also the people that studied with him, the way he worked with them, they went on to win their own Nobel Prizes. So about half a dozen people got Nobel Prizes in physics who were who was his students. And this is uh, my grandmother's first book in English, Adams and the Family. It, it's full of great anecdotes. It, it was published in 1954, just as he was dying, and he was so proud of her for doing this book. And it's, a, it's, it's really easy to read. So their legacy is our legacy. Like, we have these nuclear, we have all this nuclear technology to deal with, weapons, waste, um, all of it. So for myself, grappling with it, I created a project that I called the Neutron Trail. And this image is taken in New Mexico near where uh, my grandfather and the other scientists were putting the bomb together in the um, mid-40s. They finished it in 1945. So I took one picture in the rear view mirror and one looking forward and I put them together to kind of signify that on my Neutron Trail journey, I wanted to be able to look back, look ahead, go into any dimension that I wanted to go. And why is it called Neutron Trail? Well, I think my grandfather was a neutron genius. Um, one of his, what he won the Nobel Prize in physics for was bombarding elements with slow neutrons. So I know that sounds esoteric, but think about this. In an atom, electrons are negatively charged and the, um, Protons are positively charged and they repel each other. And then you have the neutron that's neutral, which is kind of like that idea I said at the beginning about embracing contradictions. You have to be able to stand back. So he sent the neutron into every element in the periodic table that he could get his hands on. And because it was going slowly, it was able to penetrate it and there was all different kinds of reactions. And he actually split the atom, although he didn't know it. And this slide is yellow which on the spiral symbolizes that you can look into any of the other viewpoints. So um, my grandparents had to flee Italy where they, where they were living because of Hitler. Hitler 
was, I'm sure you know, killing Jews, but he was also killing Poles and Russians and homosexuals and Jehovah's Witness. I mean, he, had, he was on this rampage. Like, eight, just Jews alone, seven, eight million people were killed. Um, so my grandmother was Jewish and she didn't want to leave. My grandfather was getting offers, but she didn't want to leave. And I think to her, home was where, home was Italy. It was her family, it was, you know, where she'd been and where her, for generations they've been there. So the idea of leaving was scary. I mean, she had hope to find freedom coming to the US, but it was scary. Whereas for Enrico, he loved science. Well, where was his home? In science, in physics. And he was part of an international community because he was, you know, getting more recognized. So I think for him, leaving was really different. It meant, you know, within a few months, it meant he had to leave his own work and work on this bomb project that he didn't really like working on. So, um, my Neutron Trail project is about taking that neutrality and discovering what are our immigration stories. So I, I hope that later I'll hear something about your immigration story or your family's immigration story and how the life conditions in the country that you came from or your family came from led you to get here and, and how that makes you look at the world now and your options moving forward. I love this picture of my grandfather. I like to make this goofy joke that he's checking his cell phone. It's actually a notebook. <laughs> he had a system of writing everything down in his notebooks. And um, purple signifies family and clan and tribal kinship, that kind of connection to all life. And again, blue is order. So you can see he was an orderly guy. He had his notebook, he's on a straight path. He's young, you know, it's in the 30s, and um, so he's in his 30s. So how do we get from there, that world that was innocent, no nuclear weapons in it, how do we get from there to now, where there's tens of thousands of nuclear warheads between Russia and the US and some other countries, and these four men were Cold War warriors. That is, they were part on, on the U.S. side of building up nuclear arms. And in 2007, they, they realized it was wrong and they called for a world free of nuclear weapons, which is amazing that they turned around like that. And so how did, you know, how did we get from there to here? That's kind of my grandparents' story. So here's this model that I've been alluding to, spiral dynamics. And it came out in the 70s. Actually, it was discovered in a university setting by a sociologist named Claire Graves. And he interviewed all his students and he figured out these different kind of paradigms that different people were living in. So the first paradigm, um, that one that says instinct-driven is beige. And that's like 100,000 years ago when we're cavemen and um, all we're thinking about is survival. So that's about life and death and our basic biology. Um, a homeless person would be in beige. And any of us would be in beige, like if there was a fire or if I had a heart attack, you know, I might start crawling. Like, I might go back to that kind of survival level. And this whole spiral is based on the idea that we have a development as a society. So there's like a psychological or a biological development we go through, right? I'm born, I can't even lift my head up, I need my mom and my dad to take care of me, and then I start to lift my head, and I can creep and turn over, and then I can crawl, and then I can walk and fall down. So this is like that too, and you can go, we can go up and we can fall back down again. So from this first survival level that's really focused on myself surviving, we go to a tribal purple level. And um, if you, if you want to learn more about this, you can Google, there's lots online. Um, I'm going to be describing it in the way it's meaningful for me. I learned about it 15 years ago and I've been kind of mulling it over. Um, so the tribal level, there's a leader, you see that big triangle in the middle, but they're kind of like a shamanic leader. And there's this kind of spiritual connection between people. And we still have purple now, we just don't think about it very much. And then the spiral goes up to red, 
because people got so close together, they got fed up, and then some of them broke out, and you start to have a more like authority, early kind of authority structure developing feudal kingdoms. And, and red ha definitely has a dark side to it. Well, they all do, but red, it really comes out. Um, and then blue, we're moving into the ability to um, sacrifice now for later. Whereas red is like, I want it now, I'm getting what I want, and that's it. Whereas blue is like Christianity, Islam, the good side of them, and um, getting, being able to um, think about the future. And then orange is, um, well, it's scientific innovation. Any kind of innovation, it can get competitive, capitalism, the Industrial Revolution, think of orange. Green, as I said before, respect for the environment, dignity. And you can see each one kind of shows a different organizing structure, right? And then yellow is um, moving up to what they call the second tier. So the first tier is all about us and them. Like, how am I gonna survive? How are we gonna survive? You know. I'm good, they're bad, and that's the subsistence level. And then the, this next level is um, we, like, hey, there's all of us on this planet, like Facebook, right? We're all here. And I'll let you read that quote. Can you all read it? I'll just let you read it yourself. So I'm, I'm just talking about a model called spiral dynamics that it's about the paradigms that we live in or the thought, like our value systems that we live in. And I just went through the different colors. So each color signifies a different value system that exists in the world. And I'll be reviewing it some, but don't try to remember all this in one hour. I mean, like I said, I've been thinking about it for quite a few years. Um, something else actually I did want to say about spiral dynamics is after this professor um, identified it, some consultants picked it up. It's been used in South Africa for about 18 years with Mandela and de Klerk. Behind the scenes, it was part of the dismantling of apartheid. Clinton, Gore, Obama, they're all aware of spiral dynamics. And I think it's time that people in the general public were more aware of it, and that's why I wanted to talk about it included as part of my family story. Spiral dynamics is holonic. Has anyone heard that word holon? It means it's a part and a whole at the same time. So like for example, your skeleton or the muscular system, it's, it's, a, it's a part, but it's also a whole itself, W-H-O-L-E. And in our body, we need all of those systems and it's holonic. In a way, you can't say, well, which is better, my muscles or my bones, you know? But this picture is very literal. Hey, how come I did that? The room is getting too warm. I'm going to have to let it cool for a couple minutes. Okay. We're such a small group, I wonder if I can. Will you see if I turn it around? Maybe we'll see. Yeah, I can say yes. So we'll do that just for a couple minutes. So this picture, that's such a different picture, right? And you can't say the other one's wrong, this is right. This one is attempting to show that, um, I'm recording a video, but I have to put the mic, right? If you like it, can you just turn it on It's okay, just put this mic in there. Um, oh, okay. I got Vanna here. <laughs> Yeah, so this one is um, showing the electromagnetic field around the heart. And, it's, and this electromagnetic field around the heart is way, way bigger than um, what's around the brain. It's kind of interesting. So it's another way of looking at ourselves. And to me, it's more the spirit of the spiral because it, it's like it's integrative, it has a flow to it. Um, and it represents that we're matter and energy, both. Now this map, I, I, I always have this in my presentations, because I sometimes I think, how crazy is that, that we think that we thought this was the world, these countries that we made up, right? And um, I mean, 
we're the only ones that know about those countries. The plants don't know. I mean, the galaxy doesn't know. But we really believe in it. And the spiral is a way to say, yeah, this is where this came from, like red, that breakout energy, blue, organizing, orange, innovation. Like, you know, you can see where it came from, but does it really make sense? And is it going to make sense in the future? Or would this make more sense? Or would, we should include this, right? Because right now the world's in our hands, climate change, right? We could just drop the planet or we could hold on to it and take care of it. So back to our family photo album of my grandparents. Um, they met in university. They were both, my grandmother was in science. She's seven, six years younger than he is. And um, he was already a pre professor. And, and when he was 24, he won this very competitive um, seat to, be, to become a tenured quantum physics professor. He's the first quantum physics chair in Italy ever. And so they met there, plus they were in the same social circle and go, go hiking. And my grandmother got a crush on him. And, um, and then she heard, and he was flirting with her a lot. And then she heard that he'd said to his friends that he was either going to buy a car or take a wife. And, and then, but he bought a car. <laughs> and she was devastated. But. I guess he decided he could do both. <laughs> I think it's a Bebe and Peugeot. That's what it says in her book. This is the wedding in 1928. Can you see it? Yeah. If you can't see, come up. So, you know, come up here if you need to. Um, so, yeah, there's my grandparents. There's my Aunt Anna, my grandmother's older sister. She would tease them and call them the alg algorithms because they were so into <laughs> math and science. And this is my grandmother's dad. So like I said, they were Jewish. He was an admiral in the Italian Navy. And Italy wasn't, it wasn't against Jews until Hitler allied with Mussolini, the leader of Italy. And then there started to be anti-Jewish laws. But I just learned this last night, actually, from the biographer. He applied for a special permit from the government that him and his family would be protected. But then the Nazis came in. So it wasn't Mussolini's forces. The Nazis came into Rome after my grandparents left. And they took him, and he was gassed at Auschwitz. He was one of the first people to die at Auschwitz. Oh, and this one's purple because, again, family, clan. Here's my grandfather at Via Panaspera, which was his very crude lab in Rome where he bombarded elements with neutrons. And that's his gang that were his students and also um, his colleagues. So they, it was very, you know, he'd just gotten this chair in physics. He didn't have that many students yet. It was, it was very informal. So they'd go to his office and he'd be drawing on the blackboard and, you know, they could ask him anything that they wanted to and he could answer the question. They called him the Pope because he, he always knew what he was doing. So this is just to remind us what happened politically in that time. And to me, it's like blue, orderly kind of life devolving with, with the chaos of negative red. And, um, oh, actually, this is a good, we're going to pause for a minute. Because, well, and then we can probably turn that back on. Right? OK, so I don't need that. I meant to read this before, and I, Forgotten. This is this is reviewing the spiral. So last real review of the spiral. Okay. Um, yeah. So I learned about it 15 years ago, and it was right before I gave my first talk, which was in Rome, Italy, for the hundredth anniversary of Enrico's birth. And I was terrified. I put these anecdotes together from my grandmother's book, and I'm like reading. You know, I'm I'm really nervous because I've never done this before. And a friend of mine. Um, She's about 15 old, years older than me. She's been kind of like prodding me along the neutron trail from the beginning. She said, here, read this book by Ken Wilbur. It's called A Theory of Everything. If you haven't read it, go read it. It's short. Change your life. In there was spiral dynamics. And I thought, wow, this is what I want to do. And I'm yellow. And, blah. and then the more I started thinking about it, I realized, no, no, I'm red and blue and orange. And maybe I'm green. So 
Yeah, so it was like, somehow I landed in, in, these, um, in these groups that did stuff where you were really focusing on the connection with your ancestors. So I started to get this big dose of purple. And then all of a sudden, the Neutron Trail got a lot more heart and soul to it. And I started to feel a lot more comfortable with what I was doing. And I stopped worrying about, well, what do people think? And they want me to be this because of my grandfather or that or whatever. And I just started being me. And now my grandfather talks to me, so it's just like everything integrated together when I let myself really immerse in purple. And, and so I think, because we're all immigrants, right? I mean, even if there's a Native person here, Craig has a little Native blood in him. Um, we're still all immigrants, because even Native people came from somewhere else, a lot longer before, right? And when we leave our country, a part of our heart, a part of, you know, we lose our language, our culture, and that, that chunk is missing, and we need it to support that spiral. We need all of those levels. Um, the downside of purple is magical thinking. So if you go read about this later, you'll see that everywhere. They just kind of write, to me, this is a critique I have of how they talk about spiral dynamics, is they, they kind of, sometimes it seems like they fluff off purple, and it's really important. Um, but that is its downside. All these colors have a, a gift, and a pitfall. So red, a gift is expansion, autonomy, courage, vitality, strength, valor, personal drive. I mean, my grandparents needed red to escape, right? Distorted, annihilates everything in its way, only cares about itself, wants what it wants, and wants its now. Probably thinking, if you're not thinking of Donald Trump a little bit, I'm surprised. Um, but. Craig and I agreed we're not going to talk politics in the Q&A. There's, there's at least two or three articles about Donald Trump and spiral dynamics. So don't worry, you can get your fill of politics and spiral dynamics but on Google. Um, so that's red. Blue, the gift is humility, service, order, sacrificing now for later, recognizing a higher power. When it's distorted, it becomes dictatorial and rigid. You know, like Hitler. Rules by, oh, sorry, rule, the, the rules that had meaning in blue, they lose their meaning because they're just being applied by rote. And it fractures and it devolves to red. So we'll see that a lot in this family story of mine that's really our story. Orange, the gift is insight, research, discovery, science, economy. I mean, I know there's bad things about capitalism, but I think if we didn't have capitalism, it would be even worse. Danger, it becomes competitive in a destructive way. It loses heart, and it, and it fractures and devolves to rigid blue. Green, the gift is a multiplicity of views, and it respects all equally, care for the environment. Green's easy to remember that color. But the danger, there's a big, big danger in green, actually, because green can get really touchy about hierarchy, and it can start rejecting red and blue in some of the earlier um, phases of the spiral. And the idea is to transcend and include, not transcend and disconnect. It's not like, oh, I'm in green and now I'm great and forget about all the other colors. No, it's to include all of them because we need them all. And then yellow, yellow, the gift is um, appreciating the unique, being able to appreciate the unique gift of each of the other colors. And you all have yellow and green and orange and blue and red and purple in you, don't worry, you got it all. And this isn't a system like, okay, I'm a green person and you're a yellow person. It's not like that. This is a system, it's, it's like I said, they're value systems. So in one part of your life, you might be more green, in another part of your life, you might be more purple. Kind of reflect on that and we'll talk about that in the Q&A. Um, yellow understands that these paradigms create our reality. So in, in all the earlier ones, if I'm in orange, I'm only in orange. If I'm in red, I'm only in red. Because, you know, think about it. If you're in a certain value system, you don't think outside that box normally unless you come to university and purposely expose yourself to other, or do something else to expose yourself to other points of view. It's not going to happen by itself. You have to ask for it. 
And yellow can go up and down the spiral. It's danger, similar to green, it can end up feeling superior and get too intellectual. So do you think we could turn it on again? Enrico, sorry, Enrico was getting a lot of job offers by this time when these anti-racial laws were coming in. And so he was saying to Laura, uh, my nani, you know, let's move, and she didn't want to go. And then, um, and, oh, you can't read it, I'll read it to you. This was um, from Columbia University, and it says, cannot accept professor, professorship, thank you. So he was turning down all these offers. Have you guys seen a telegram before? It was a primitive way of sending a text, <laughs> basically. Um, so this is a, a chance for you to reflect a little bit. You know, what does home mean to you? You know, I was telling you how for my grandmother, home was her people and all the all her friends and Italy, Florence, Rome. My grandfather home was science. Where did your family come from? I see we have a good mix of colors in the room, it's nice. Um, how has your story shaped you? And um, I think this is a really important question. What do you want home to mean to you here on? I mean, that's something I keep coming back to in my life. I'm, I'm pushing 60, but I still, you know, I still keep asking that question. I hope I never stop asking it. Here's my little family arriving in the United States in 1939. My grandfather, um, he won the Nobel Prize, and so by that time my grandmother agreed, okay, yeah, we have to go, it's getting too dangerous, and um, they collected the prize and arrived in January 1939. So Enrico, my mom, my uncle, and at that time, you see, when he won the Nobel Prize for bombarding the elements, nobody knew he'd, he'd um, split the atom. But other scientists, um, Lise Meitner, Otto Hahn, figured it out. And so by the time he arrived, it was like, uh-oh, this means we can create a bomb. And nobody wanted to talk about it. By 1940, actually, the scientific community self-imposed secrecy upon themselves because they were so afraid that Hitler would build a bomb. And in that line, a scientist who my grandfather was working with closely, Szilard, approached my grandfather and Einstein, and they, um, I'll read this highlighted part. Some recent work by Fermi and Szilard leads me to, this is from Einstein, they, they wrote it for him, but he signed it, to expect that the element uranium may be turned into a new and important source of energy, vast amounts of power, would also lead to construction of bombs. So it's like the scientists are going, you know, hey, US government, pay attention. This is like scary potential here. 
And then um, Hitler actually started to invade other countries, starting with Poland, shortly after that letter by Szilard, who was also Jewish and also immigrated to the United States. This photo, I don't, can you see it? It's so tragic. It's in Poland, it's two sisters, and the one's been, you can see she's been killed, and the other sister is mourning her, her death. And then um, December 1941, um, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, which is in Hawaii, and the United States had been very reluctant to join the war, but that was it. After that, we were in. And it really was a world war. It was taking place in Europe and in Southeast Asia. And Japan and Hitler and Mussolini were allies. Japan was um, committing a horrific genocide on the scale of Hitler. So like 10 million Chinese were killed and many other people. They, they committed horrific war crimes. Um, the government, I'm not saying the people and um, the prisoner of war camps were horrific. So that's part of the backstory of, well, how come the US got so onto Japan? And another thing that's disturbing about the whole thing of dropping the bomb is that the emperor and his military government in Japan knew for at least two years that they could not win the war and they refused to surrender, so they were basically using their own citizens as cannon fodder. And then, of course, the US committed genocide and war crimes by firebombing over 60 cities in Japan, and then on top of that, dropping the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So when you look at World War II, it's, it's horrific all around. It's just, it's horrific all around, really, the amount of death. It's, it's the deadliest war that's ever happened in human history. Um, back in Chicago, well now they've moved to Chicago, my family. So I love this little cartoon. Maybe, maybe you should walk around with it. It's just so, it's so cool, so people can really see it. So my, my grandfather's there. Um, it's this cartoon, and he's pulling a control rod out. And actually, he was for real. He was up in the gallery giving instructions. And it's a pile of uranium. It's in an underground squash court at the University of Chicago. So it's in the middle of the city. It was like 20 minutes from where I grew up. I could walk over there, but it was radioactive. you know. So it was buried a long time ago by the time I walked over there. Um, and he just, he just had them pulling this rod out, like inch by inch, and checking his calculations on his slide rule. And he knew exactly when it would go critical, you know, when, when the chain reaction would be self-sustaining. And then you know, he told them to shut it down. And that top part, I don't know if you saw sort of a pillow looking thing, on top. That was a big pile of cadmium, which would have just shut the whole thing down, and they called them the suicide squad, so these guys were up there with this big pile of, of cadmium, and they would have dropped it if my grandfather had made a mistake. Thanks. And this is a 10-year reunion picture. There's my grandfather. There's Herb Anderson. His kids used to babysit for me and my brother. And um, there's Szilard. There's the only woman physicist on the team, Leona Marshall. And I think that's Harold Agnew. He was one of the youngest ones. And he flew in the plane behind the one that dropped the bomb on Hiro Hiroshima. And he made a film, which is in the museum there in Hiroshima. It's Chilling. Yeah, they just really, uh, Can you see that one? Maybe show that one. They restored it, actually. Mm -hmm. That's okay, leave it. Just Great. Okay. Cool. See it? So after this successful experiment, um, everybody went over to my grandparents' house um, for a party, and my grandmother didn't know what was going on because the scientists had self-imposed secrecy, and everybody was coming in, congratulations, Enrico, congratulations, Dr. Fermi, and they, my grandmother and my grandfather, they were used to talking about what he was doing, she had helped him write a textbook back in Rome, and all of a sudden they were just giving her blank looks when she said what was going on, and that went on for three years. 
She didn't know anything that was happening. And that was happening, you know, in families too, because part of the family was working on the Manhattan Project and they didn't even know what they were working on. And then the rest of their family wasn't allowed to know where they were or what they were doing. So it affected tens and tens of thousands of people across the United States. That was imposed. What By that time it was imposed, imposed. yeah, still. yeah. This was still the self-imposed, but very soon after this it was imposed. That's a picture of General Groves. He, I put blue and orange on here because both of them have both actually. Um, the order and the creativity groves. Um, not only did he, was he the leader of the Manhattan Project and, and he got, I forget how much of it's hundreds of millions of dollars or a bill, like a billion. It's like some number that you think, how could that be in 1945 that they would spend that much money? Like in those 1945 dollars. And Oppenheimer was the civilian leader of the Manhattan Project. He was a scientist and my grandfather was assistant director, you know, directly under him. But Groves also masterminded the Pentagon. I mean, he was quite, quite a orange kind of a guy too. Like he really had both. Niels Bohr was one of the older physicists and he was the one that predicted to build an atomic bomb, you'd have to use the resources of the entire country. So this dot is where uh, my grandmother, my mom, my uncle, and Rico were living. That's Los Alamos, so that's where they actually built the bomb. And then up here in Richland, Washington, um, this is where they refined the plutonium. And in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, is where they um, refined the uranium. So they made two bombs, a plutonium bomb and a uranium bomb. And then these other cities were also involved. But Enrico was actually going to these different places. And speaking of contradictions, he was an enemy alien, because remember Hitler and Mussolini from Italy were allies. And he had top secret clearance. So can you imagine the pressure? He's assistant director of the Manhattan Project. And he's an enemy alien. He has top secret clearance. That's Enrico and that's my mom, Nella. So this is at Los Alamos. My mom went to high school there. In April 1945, Roosevelt died. Truman became president. He didn't know anything about the bomb project. Nothing. That's how secret it was. So that was April. And then in July, they tested it. In August, they dropped it. So he only had a few months to think about what he wanted to do. And yeah, it seems like that is a really interesting turning point in history to think about. Um, in May, Germany surrendered. And so then some of the scientists started to have, you know, a little bit of qualms, like, why are we building this bomb if Hitler fell and the reason we were doing it was to stop Hitler? And only one of them left, Joseph Rockblatt. He actually left the project. And he was banned from the United States for a number of years because he left. Um, so this is very green, right? Like these scientists are thinking about the whole planet. They're not just thinking about we have to win the war. And Rob Black went on to, he, he stayed in nuclear disarmament. He won a, a Nobel Peace Prize in 1985, actually, so pretty amazing. Szilard tried to start a petition. He was one of the most vocal. My grandfather was arguing, but behind the scenes, he didn't say anything. One, one time he stayed up all night arguing with Oppenheimer that they shouldn't even test the bomb. And then that recommendation had to go to Truman, but of course Oppenheimer is the boss of the ruling, so they said, yeah, we need to test it. They probably would have tested it anyway. I don't think the scientists could have stopped it. They, they might have wanted to, but I don't think they were in the right power position to stop it. So that's the first atomic bomb. Isn't that crazy looking? And there's the test. And um, I don't know exactly when that, I don't know if that was really taken on the day of the test, but remember I said the pitfall of orange was to get disconnected from your heart. And it seems like having to do this would definitely disconnect you from your heart in some way. I mean, you'd, you'd have to like kind of set your feelings aside to, to keep doing it. This picture is crazy too because it was so radioactive there and they're standing there, you know, having U.S. Army press photo, that's General Groves and Oppenheimer, the, the leaders. 
I, un I understand my grandfather was inside the tank, you know, to go out and take some measurements or something like that. Then the, the atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, ending the war. 50 to 80 million people were killed in the war of World War II. So that's why I put peace here also. People were grateful. Even some Japanese, believe it or not, were grateful. Um, I've actually had a few Japanese people say that to me. So I just want you to think for a minute, 20 or 30 million people completely unaccounted for in that war. Like, isn't that, isn't that sobering that 50 to 80 million people died? Like how many people, how many whole villages must have disappeared that nobody even knew about? And I put beige for this one, you know, back at that basic survival level. This is, this is another, I'm, I'm like 99% sure this is a press photo. It just has that look about it. And it was taken actually in 46. It wasn't even taken in 45. And Enrico's holding a picture of the atom bomb. And that's an illusion. We can't hold that in our hands. It's such, it's such awesome power that we're humbled by it. And Edward Teller, they were good friends of like the, the two couples, you know, my grandparents and Teller and his wife were good friends, but politically they did not see eye to eye. Teller was one of the ones that was part of the whole buildup of nuclear weapons during the Cold War. And he was pushed, he pushed for the development of the hydrogen bomb. So after the war, the scientists who had been thinking about this for the longest were the first to be calling for, you know, some kind of united world oversight of weapons. To, they saw the risk of nuclear proliferation. So that's green. They were green leaders to me, those scientists. And where that's taken us, right? that vision that they had, this is from Facebook. But isn't that cool? I mean, there's no separate countries. You can talk to anybody you want, as long as they have internet. So that's kind of an example of the spiral and how it, it keeps evolving. I mean, yeah, for sure right now we see there's places where it's devolving, but what I, I find the spiral hopeful overall because it gives us a way of saying, okay, yeah, it's falling apart over here, but this could, you know, purple could be healthy and then red and then blue it could build back up again. So um, after the, the war, my grandfather walked in with a report explaining the work he'd been doing and, and that really got my grandmother thinking and then, you know, he, he died and my grandmother, it's like she just blossomed, you know, she wrote that book, Adams and the Family. Um, she, she wrote this book, Atoms for the World. She, she went to a, this is, oh yeah, it's a little bit of green I managed to put in there. It was very green, it was a, um, it was 1955, an international conference of all these scientists like from Russia, from China, from the US, and somehow they were allowed to meet and talk to each other even though their countries were at war. And, and that makes me think about that Facebook picture, right? Because there's countries at war right now, but there's countries that are enemies, but people don't think that way. She, in one year, I don't know, 61 or something, she wrote, 61 or 62, she wrote two books. One was co-authored about Galileo, who was the, the greatest scientist of Italy, well, until my grandfather, right? And then, and then but this, at the same time, she wrote about Mussolini. So to me, she was, again, willing to embrace contradictions, look at the light and the dark of her culture. And um, she was a pioneer in the air pollution control movement. In um, 1959, has anyone here heard of this book? Silent Spring? Okay, yeah. Okay, great. So, Birth of the Environmental Movement. That was 1962, yeah. And, and my grandmother started her thing in 1959. So, I mean, she was in the same kind of green wave that Rachel Carson was. Like, that green wave was really getting stronger. So, this, this crazy chart, I remember from when I was little, and you, you cut a hole in the middle, so this is how you measure pollution in the early 1960s. You look at how dark it is. 
that's it. You don't do any chemical analysis of it, you just look at how dark it is. And she, she and her women colleagues, they were able to um, get laws passed in the city of Chicago that um, changed from coal, which was really dirty, to gas. So then my memories start to come in, and that's like the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was, do you guys know what the Cuban Missile Crisis was? Russia and missiles located at Cuba Yeah, nuclear missiles. So it, that was really scary. I remember my, my parents were really, really terrified. And that affected me as a little kid, because I knew that my grandfather was this amazing scientist, and then there was something wrong about his work. And I was, can you imagine a five-year-old trying to sort that out? I mean, I was really confused. This is a cartoon from 1962. It's the 18th hole, and it says, go ahead and putt. You know, it's kind of like, well, we're going to be annihilated, so you might as well putt your last putt. My, my dad drew that picture for me. Not, not Enrico, my dad, dad, right? And um, it was, I don't know, it was probably like six or maybe seven. And he was really worried about ab above ground nuclear testing. Maybe walk around with it, because there's a mushroom cloud there, not just cows. So the, the, the above ground nuclear testing, the radioactivity would go into the atmosphere and go around the earth. And then it would rain down. So that means the milk had a little bit of radioactivity in it. So think like, you know, global Fukushima, you're setting bombs off everywhere. So again, you know, I had that confusion as a kid. I grew up feeling pride and shame, but it was this, you know, kind of stew. I didn't know what to do with it. Oops. So just a few cartoons here. Mutually Assured Destruction, have you guys heard of that? It's when and this one, you don't have to walk around, I'll just say. So the arms is a whole bunch of weapons, and the legs is prosthetic devices. You know, legs. And this one says, more bombs deter more. Next slide, please. <laughs> so in 1967, there was um, kind of a celebration of the, what is that? The 25th, I guess, of the atomic pile, that nuclear reaction that my grandfather did. And that's me, my brother, a picture of Enrico, my grandmother, and you know, I, I was kind of dazed. I mean, I knew, okay, we're on TV, but I didn't really understand. And this is the statue that they unveiled, and it was done by a artist, Henry Moore, and you can see it kind of has a mushroom cloud shape at the top, and he said that the lower part was meant to be like a cathedral, that would um, that nuclear energy would protect us, and someone asked my grandmother, "Well, what do you think of it?" She had to unveil it, right? And she had to pull the string, and and she said, "No comment." And I poked around and I found an article where she was really angry that they were mixing nuclear energy and nuclear weapons together, and we still have that same problem now because actually the safest um, nuclear energy that would use 99% of the uranium instead of only 1% like they do now and it would make so much less waste. There's this fear of it, of it being stolen to build weapons and you know, so it's this, we got ourselves in a really bad vicious cycle. Like we wouldn't need wind or solar or anything, like we'd just be able to do it all. Well, we could use that too, but we certainly wouldn't need coal. You know, we'd be able to have clean energy we'd gone a slightly different route. Like maybe if we'd never built the weapons in the first place, we wouldn't have some of the contradictions and dilemmas that we do. After, um, this is Chicago, it's a gun death. After the environmental movement started to take off in the 70s, my grandmother said, okay, well, that's taken care of. Other people are worrying about the environment. I'm gonna worry about handgun control. Can you believe it? She started the first handgun control committee in America. That's incredible, right? She wasn't quite as successful as she was with the environmental thing. And um, her little neighborhood group led to the National Brady Campaign Organization. Like she actually mentored someone who helped start the Brady Campaign. Also in the 70s, we got this view from space. So this was the first time we really saw our world from the outside. 
were horrible. Yeah. And in the 80s, we start to really have big nuclear disarmament. You know, you have the murmur of the scientists in the beginning, but now it really starts to take off. This is um, some women in England. Somehow they managed to get past the security and they're on top of this missile silo thing, making a circle. And, um, okay, so jumping a little bit forward, 2010. I'm on the neutron trail, but I don't know it yet. And I'm going to Los Alamos and Trinity. Trinity's um, southwestern, south, southern New Mexico, where they tested the bomb. And we passed this town, Carrizozo. And um, the activists that I'm traveling with, they tell me that the US Army thought of evacuating this town, but they didn't. And the narrative that we hear is that the atom bomb was tested in the desert and there was nobody there. But that's only partly true because the radioactive cloud actually blew over these neighboring communities, including Carrizozo. And so radioactive fallout landed on their crops, on their water supply. There were cows that were, their hair fell out on one side, depending if they were like taking a nap or just the way the wind hit them. And then the other side, they were normal. And there's a much higher rate of cancer in that community. That's another picture of Carrizozo. And this clock is called the Carrizozo clock. It stopped at the time of the Trinity test, first thing in the morning. And to me, this is yellow because it, it pops you out of whatever, you know, if you're upset about it or whatever you're feeling. I mean, this group, we're probably, most of us are gonna be more upset because we're younger. Maybe, maybe you remember enough that you're like, it was really good at the time, right? I mean, I can't tell you how many people older than me have thanked me for what my grandfather did and what those scientists did. Like, that's how big of a paradigm shift we've gone through. That we, it's hard for us to see that it was good now. At the time, it was really seen as good. Craig's nodding too, because he's a young man. <laughs> I mean, even I am, it's hard for me. This is um, one of my friends that I made down there, Tina Cordova and some of the other activists. And, and she did some kind of ad hoc epidemiological studies and with a tremendous amount of persistence got the Centers for Disease Control to do a proper study. And that's how they were finally exonerated. Yes, there really was radioactive fallout from the Trinity test and they should be compensated. This is Marian Naranjo. I'm almost done, there's only a few more slides. Um, Marion is so purple. She's, she lives on a native, um, it's a Pueblo near Los Alamos. She grew up on the Pueblo, she trained as a traditional potter, but she went to school with scientist kids. So she's this incredible blend of, of, of um, indigenous culture really deep and Western, you know, kind of, scientific thinking, and she's worked for many, many years um, at Los Alamos National Lab, advocating for, for better handling of toxic waste, and very, very difficult place to sit and not just get completely frustrated. I mean, I just admire her so much, her patience, her diligence, her persistence. So, to me, she goes from purple to green and, and on to yellow, this, this one. That's just a picture of me um, looking back at the bomb and, you know, I noticed that picture was orange and I, I think as a growing up I was really orange and naturally moved toward green as our society was doing. And that spiral was behind my grappling with the neutron trail issues. This is another one of the psychology today, more under the microscope. Again, it's a way of standing back. What the hell are we doing? When I go out on the neutron trail, like if I was here longer, I might do a workshop. And um, this particular workshop was in Richland, Washington, where I mentioned they refined the plutonium for the bomb. And um, it was really interesting trip because I, I, I can get feisty. And I, I got into a discussion with one of the retired engineers 
wanting to know, well, when did they know that it was, that radiation was bad, and kind of like nailing down what year, and he started to get a little roughly, you know, his back was getting up a bit. And then we did the workshop, and in the workshop, I really, I really elicit a lot of conversation, and people were in groups, and, um, you know, I ask tough questions, but I really give people space, so I, I try to balance being tough and gentle. And at the end, he came up to me and he said, you know, and he, and he was all relaxed, no more roughly. And he, he said, you know, I had some conversations and we opened up, because these people, they've known each other for decades. They've been working together. He said, I, we had conversations that we never have. We talked about things in a way that we never talked about before. So that's how I know that there's something important to do this. Um, now we're jumping for the, the last, couple minutes, we're jumping to Iran, where um, the Iran nuclear deal was recently ratified, that um, many people think is a good thing, I think is a good thing. I'm not going to talk about the deal, but I just wanted to say that. And I got to Iran on the nu neutron trail because I was invited to speak about the Iran nuclear deal as part of a panel. There was two experts and me, the humanist, right? And so part of my talk, I'm just going to show you a tiny bit. Um, have you heard of Rumi, the mystical poet? I'll read you the quote. Every enemy is your medicine. Okay? Every enemy is your medicine. That's an interesting concept, isn't it? In terms of embracing contradictions. Your beneficial alchemy and heart healing. Carry the burden smilingly and cheerfully. So maybe if you have an enemy, think about where are they on the spiral and what was their life conditions that made them be the way they are. Because patience is the key to victory. So again, that's a neutrality, standing back. And um, there's an incredible tradition in Persia of telling these, um, they're called Sufi stories, they're teaching stories. And this, this Sufi teacher, Nasruddin, is famous, beloved, and um, one night he was out, it was at night, it was dark out, he was out looking for his keys under a street light, okay? And this guy comes along and he says, um, Nasruddin, can I help you? What are you doing? And, and Nasruddin says, I'm looking for my keys. So the guy helps him and they look, you know, and they don't find them. Like 10 minutes goes by and, you know, the guy is respectful because he's a Sufi teacher. But eventually he says, Nasruddin, where did you lose them? And the Sufi says, in my house. And so the guy goes, but, well, then why are we looking out here? And Nasruddin says, because there's more light. <laughs> and you can take that story in many, many different meanings, but I think for tonight's talk, the way to, one, one good way to look at it is if you look in the light, you know, you might not progress very far on the spiral. You, you might have to look where it's difficult to embrace some contradictions. You might have to grope in the dark a bit before you find your keys. And to finish off on a, on a hopeful note, because sometimes things look pretty depressing out there, um, and you can look up this TED talk. Ronnie Edry, he's from Israel, and um, he started reaching out to people in Iran on Facebook. And um, I'm not a historian, but I have a, a young Persian friend, and he turned me on to this phenomenon, actually. And he was um, pointing out to me that historically, Iran and Israel are not enemies at all. They've helped each other, and actually, out in the Middle East, except for Israel, the largest population of Jews lives in Iran. And they live there, they can go to synagogue and all of that. So there's, you know, there's a lot of posturing going on that isn't necessarily true. So he started putting these on Facebook. Okay, we're going to have to walk around. I'm just going to put through one. And this is the end, is these, these images.
So this is a this is a gay couple and um, Israel, and they're sending love to Iran. And, um, and this is a traditional couple in Iran sending love to Israel. Also, it's it's really moving. The TED talk is great. These are Jews, traditional um, practicing Jew, Jews in Iran. You, know, you would think that was a picture from Israel, but it's from Iran. And there's another one from Iran of a Jew praying. And there's hundreds of thousands of people doing this on these groups on Facebook. So they're, you know, they're flying in the face of the political rhetoric of their government. And then um, we're back to that slide of the world in our hands. And um, we're about to go into a time of sharing. And yeah, I'm really hoping that I've shared enough of myself that you all feel comfortable to share some of yourself. And maybe what the talk made you think about or what home means to you or the kind of home you want to build for yourself or for the world. And um, Craig's going to help me facilitate this, right? Thank you.